In the last video, we looked at the greatest hedge fund of all time, Renaissance Technologies, and its flagship fund medallion, which since 1988 has delivered net returns of around 39.1% after fees. This incredible performance has made founder Jim Simons a billionaire many times over, with an official net worth of $21.6 billion. So today we're going to be looking at Simon's story and seeing why some have described him as the world's smartest billionaire. Simon's demonstrated his mathematical prowess at a very young age. As a very young kid, maybe four, something called Zeno's Paradox. Did you ever hear of Zeno's Paradox? My father told me that the car could run out of gas. And I was disturbed by that notion. I, it never occurred to me. But then I thought, well, it shouldn't run out. It could always use half of what it has, and then it could use half of that, and then half of that, and it could go on forever, and so it would never run out. Sorry. So, now, it didn't occur to me, yes, but it wouldn't get very far either. But, uh, but the idea that, in principle, you didn't have to run out of gas was uh, kind of a, a profound thought for a, for a very little boy. Simon studied math as an undergrad at MIT. He joined MIT at the age of 17, and he graduated just three years later at the age of 20. And even he found in his initial freshman years at 17 years old, the graduate courses, which some undergrads could attend, very difficult to get his head around, initially anyway. When I went to MIT, I majored in mathematics, of course, and skipped the first year because I'd had some of those courses in high school. And I even took a graduate course in my freshman year of a second semester uh, in math because it said, no uh, prerequisites required. So I said, oh, no prerequisites, I'll take that course. Had a very hard time getting my arms around that course. I finished it okay, but I, I was very puzzled by some of the concepts. However, that summer, I got another book. I got a book on, this, this was algebra, but it, not algebra like solving equations. It was abstract algebra. And then in a week, Everything came together for me. Simons completed his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, at the grand old age of 23. They wanted me to go to Berkeley and get away from MIT, meet some new faculty, because I was quite close to the MIT faculty, and they thought, I, I think they didn't want to get rid of me so much as they thought I was probably pretty good. He also taught math at MIT and this pretty unknown university called Harvard. I didn't like Harvard, actually. I don't know. I mean, I liked MIT, I, didn't, I wasn't so crazy about Harvard. In 1964, Simons began working for the Institute for Defense Analysis, the IDA, at Princeton. The IDA was a super secret branch of the NSA aimed at breaking Cold War codes. And the work Simons did remains confidential to this day. There was a place in Princeton called the Institute for Defense Analyses, which uh, was a very highly classified joint and it specialized in cracking uh, Russian codes and protecting our own. So it was a, uh, under the auspices of the NSA. Simons enjoyed working for the IDA because they paid well, and as well as this, they allowed him to spend half of his time working on his own mathematical research and half his time working on breaking these Cold War codes. And this place hired mathematicians, a handful. You could do mathematics half your time, and the other half of your time, you were supposed to work on their stuff. There was no teaching, so it was like, well, I could do as much mathematics as I was doing anyway. And, and, they, and they paid better. And I thought this would be interesting and a, and a nice change. And it was. So it worked out pretty well for Simons. And as well as this, it also gave him his first real glimpse into computing and the utilization of algorithms. But I like the idea of developing algorithms, seeing them put on the computer, and seeing, uh, you know, if it's, if it's going to work. So that experience was very influential when I went into the hedge fund business. However, four years later, in 1968, Simons was fired from the IDA after he stated his views against the Vietnam War in an interview. He stated that he would only work on his own mathematical research whilst the US was still at war in Vietnam. In those days, it was secret that it was even codes and ciphers, so I just said their stuff. Uh, but you could spend 50% of your time in mathematics. And so my algorithm now is, 
until the Vietnam War is over, I will spend all my time on mathematics. And then, after it's over, I'll spend all my time on their stuff until the two things match up again, and then... Uh, it occurred to me to tell my local boss that I gave this interview. And he said, well, what'd you tell him? I said, well, I, I told him what I just said to you. He said, you did? He says, oh, I better call Taylor, his boss. And he called Taylor, and, uh, and I came back into his office, and he said, you're fired. He protested his firing to no avail. I said, you know, I don't know how you can fire me. My title is permanent member, which was. I started as a temporary member, and then I became a permanent member. And the boss was very funny. He said, well, here's the difference between a temporary member and a permanent member. A temporary member has a, has a contract. Permanent member doesn't. I had no contract, so I was out of there. He then became chairman of the math department at Stony Brook University. Stony Brook University came along and asked if I would be the chair of their math department which was a weak department and needed strengthening. Stony Brook was flush with cash at the time as Governor Nelson Rockefeller, yes, grandson of John D. Rockefeller, recommended a major new public university to be built on Long Island to stand with the finest in the country. With this financial backing, Simons helped to transform Stony Brook into a world-class math department. It was a time when the state university was flush with money which is certainly not the case today, but they had a lot of money. Rockefeller was, pres was a governor, and he really wanted to see the state university flourish. And I was able to uh, make very good offers to people, and it turned from a, uh, a weak department to, you know, a very strong one. In terms of his own mathematical research, Simon's life work mainly focused on the topology and geometry of manifolds and he helped to co-develop the Chern-Simons theory, which has actually since been used in string theory. The physicists started using this. Witten, uh, many of you maybe have heard of Witten, a uh, famous physicist. He used it in string theory and then people used it in what's called condensed matter physics. So this math it's called Chern Simon's stuff, invariance or whatever, uh, terms, it's a term, uh, started appearing all over physics. Simon's first experience in business came during his days at MIT. His father had some money to invest and Simon's thought of two good friends he had at MIT who were from Bogota, Colombia. And no, he didn't want them to start that business. Funny people say that I'm like hyper. You got your perspective. D-Rock would know, like, I don't even drink a cup of coffee ever, all right? It's all these people like, what gives you so much energy? Gratitude. But he thought that they were very smart and they could execute and make use of the fact that at the time, Colombia was a good place to start businesses in certain sectors. And I saw this country, Colombia, and it was really a place that you could do anything. I, really, I was told if you start a business, a manufacturing business, and you're making something that was imported, previously imported to Colombia, the government would shut off those imports and give you clear uh, road to, to run. So I, I thought my friend should start some kind of business like that, which, which they did. During his graduate studies at Berkeley, Simons actually got married. He received $5,000 as a wedding gift and invested into two stocks. However, he found this was quite boring, so he changed his investment to soybean futures. Uh, I got married and uh, we ha I, had five I got $5,000 worth of uh, wedding gifts. So I, my wife and I decided, well, I decided, she, but she was willing, that we should invest this and I, uh, I had a couple of stocks, which for no good reason I thought might do well. And uh, so I went, opened an account in San Francisco with, with uh, Merrill Lynch. I bought these two stocks, I went home, and for months they did absolutely nothing. So they didn't go down, they didn't go up. So I went back and I, I said, do you have anything that's a little more uh, exciting? 
And he said, yes. He said, you should buy soybeans. So I bought two contracts of soybeans. And within a week, it had gone up quite a lot. And I'd made several thousand dollars, maybe two or three. Now that was exciting. And uh, I, I came back to the math department and I said to one of the older guys, I told him what happened. He said, and I said, do you have any idea what I should do? He said, absolutely, sell it immediately. <laughs> which was extremely good advice because within a day or two it had gone back down and it was bouncing around and actually had a little loss. I closed out the position. In the mid-70s, Simon started to get more serious about trading and investing and invested some of the profits from that Colombian business which was now paying off and started to trade foreign currencies. The South American business had uh, was beginning to throw off some money. so. I had some money and uh, I thought I would uh, uh, start investing and, uh, and I had an interest in foreign currencies. I don't know why, but I did and uh, I, I read a lot about that. So we started, uh, I started, you know, I got a partner investing in, uh, in foreign currencies and uh, that did very well. Simons hired world-class cryptanalyst Lenny Baum to begin the journey of making the strategy more systematic. I looked at the charts and they looked like there was some structure to these historical charts that one could perhaps exploit. So I hired the best cryptanalyst in the world, a guy named Lenny Baum. They had some early success with the pound, for example. Margaret Thatcher has been sitting on the pound and it has to go up. I said, oh, well, I wish you'd come here this morning. He said, why? I said, because Margaret Thatcher just stood up. And uh, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher just stood up and the pound is way up. He said, how much is it up? He, I said, well, it's, it's up at nickels, five cents so far. He said, it's gonna go up 50 cents, a dollar. Buy pounds, we should buy pounds. I said, okay, buy pounds. Sure enough, it went way, way up. They were trading fundamentally at the time and Simons knew that there was an element of a look to what they were doing. Simons wanted to make things more systematic and remove that element of chance. And a good example of how they were lucky is a story about gold. And it was, it was fantastic. And it was all fundamental trading. Still, I felt that, okay, we can't. We were lucky in, in certain ways. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you one good story about luck. Uh, gold, which was uh, illegal to trade, had become legal to trade. And the gold market, gold prices were going up. And we bought gold in the, in the firm. We bought gold, we had a pretty big position. In fact, Lenny and I split the position. Half of it belonged to him in some sense and half belonged to me. And uh, it was at $200.50, I mean, and $250, and it got up to 300, 400, 500, 550, I think. I said, Lenny, you know, I think we should sell this already. He said, no, no, you don't know how far it'll go. You don't know how far it'll go. So I sold my half and it, and it kept going up. And, and one day it, it reached $800. And that day I happened to be speaking to a friend of mine who was a stockbroker, but we were just, I was just chatting with him over the phone. And I said, what's new? He said, well, what's new is this. My wife went into my closet this morning and cleaned it out of all my old gold cufflinks and tie clasps. <laughs> and she's now down uh, uh, selling it. I said, well, Dick, I mean, are you having financial difficulties? Uh, how can he said, no, no, but she's a jeweler, which she was, and she only had to stand in the short line. I said, the short line? He says, don't you know there's lines and lines of people selling gold? I said, no, but I'm very glad you told me. 
<laughs> I hung up with him. I picked up the phone, which went right to the floor of the exchange, and I got Lenny to come over. And I said, Lenny, sell the gold. He said, no, you don't know how far it's gone. I was the boss, and I said, sell the effing gold. <laughs> <laughs> he said, okay, okay. And he sold the gold, it was, it was $810 or something like that. The next morning, we came in and it was $820. And he was so mad. By the end of that day, it was $650. The, the market collapsed and went nowhere but down after that until it, it got back to $250 or $300. Not, not in a week, but it, it just collapsed. Now that was totally good luck. I mean, it was good that I realized if everyone is selling something, it may be a time to sell it yourself. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, was, uh, it was luck, it was, just, it was just luck. Simon set up the Medallion Fund in 1988, and very early on they were actually losing money, so they had to close the fund to investors to have a study period to find out exactly what was going wrong and why they were losing money. Now in this time, some investors took their money and withdrew it, but others had faith that Simon's and his team could execute and boy, that faith paid off. So we closed the fund, and I told the investors we're gonna spend, we're gonna do a study period, and we're not gonna trade at all. Of course, we're not gonna charge any fees. Oh, at that point, it was five, five and 20. It was 5% fixed fee and 20% of profits. And, uh, and everyone stuck with us. A few people redeemed, but everyone stuck with us. And for six months, uh, and we brought back someone who had left the firm, and, and it's a long story, but we brought back this other very good guy, Axe Left, and he and I, especially he, he had some ideas of much shorter term trading, uh, not high frequency in and, and out in five minutes, but trading on a much shorter term, and he developed a pretty good system. Simons is also notorious at Rentec for having stringent NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and these are lifetime NDAs. If an employee has been there for a few years, they have the option to sign a non-compete. And this basically allows them to access more of the Medallion Fund bonus pool, or bonus ocean rather. For no, forever non-disclosure. And uh, after you've been there a couple of years, uh, there's a non-compete agreement that you're invited to sign, and pretty much everyone does because there's a lot of money that's uh, out of your bonus, a certain amount is held back uh, for a while and then uh, invested in medallion actually, uh, and, and then you get it over time. But uh, so there's always, you always have a lot of money on the table which you've not yet gotten received, which keeps people from running off. Simons does not entertain the prospect of somebody using their intellectual property somewhere else. For example, two physics PhDs from MIT, Alexander Belopolsky and Pavel Wolfben, both ironically Russian, joined Rentec in 2001. However, they both quit in mid-2003 to join Israel Englander's hedge fund Millennium Management. The two Russians, as Simons refers to them as, had signed NDAs prohibiting them from using or sharing medallion secrets. They had, however, refused to sign non-compete agreements, viewing the firm as underhanded for slipping them in a pile of other papers to be signed, according to a colleague. With no signed non-compete agreement to worry about, Englander figured that he had the right to hire the researchers as long as they didn't use any of Renaissance's secrets. Rentec wasted no time in suing for trade secret violations. The outcome? Englander's firm had to fire the two Russians and pay Rentec $20 million. Do not mess with Rentex IP. Simons tells an interesting story in which an astrophysicist turned down the opportunity to work at Rentec. We have a, a renaissance, a, a colloquium uh, every week. Someone comes and gives a talk. The scientist, and, and it's open to the public. And um, one day an astronomer, a young astronomer came in, a friend of his already worked at Renaissance, and, and this guy came and he, and he gave a very good talk gave a very good talk. And I took him aside afterwards and says, you know, your friend is here and uh, you would like working here. 
you wouldn't like working here. We would like to have you work here. And he said, well, it sounds very appealing, but I'm, right now I'm in a project, that I, science project, that I really want to complete before I think about doing anything else. So he won the Nobel Prize. Simons has repeatedly emphasized the fact that this managerial success is due to hiring the smartest people and providing them an infrastructure in which they flourish. They have the best incentives, they have a collaborative environment, and they have world-class infrastructure in which they can slot into straight away. Simons' favorite algorithm? Well, that's confidential. My favorite algorithm is something that I uh, worked out when I was at the Institute for Defense Analyses. And it has to do with uh, It has to do with solving a certain classical problem in the field. And I solved it, but it's classified. <laughs> it is, I solved this problem and they made a special purpose machine at, at, at NSA and I heard that 30 years later it was still, they were still using this special purpose machine to implement this, this algorithm, so that's, that's my favorite algorithm, and it's classified, so. Uh. <laughs> now, of course, in any story, there is always controversy of some sort, and in Simon's case, this pertains to the IRS. In 2014, a bipartisan Senate panel estimated that medallion investors had underpaid their taxes by around $6.8 billion over more than a decade by masking short-term gains as long-term returns. This all centered around transactions known as basket options between Rentec and Deutsche and Barclay banks, disrespectively. This allowed Rentec to convert their profits from rapid day trading, which is obviously subject to higher income tax rates often, to longer term lower tax capital gains. As a result, the IRS is seeking billions of dollars in back taxes, interest and penalties. In conclusion, Jim Simons has had a truly extraordinary life. And although he's not a household name like Warren Buffett, his story would certainly be fitting of a movie, and a very interesting movie at that. Who are you? Oh, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm Jim Simons. Buffett. 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 Buffett.